Let's start. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me for a meeting like this. And uh, I've uh, been knowing many of the leaders of this, I mean, free thinkers earlier also. And uh, it, it's really nice that uh, I really meet you this evening. And uh, what I generally try to tell during these days when I'm invited for a lecture, what people want to know about uh, is the case that I'm involving or, or the blasphemy case that is going on against me. I will certainly speak about that. But uh, let me start uh, with uh, the primary things. I come from India, as you know. Uh, we have an organization, namely the Indian Rationalist Association. Uh, rationalist is not a very popular name in Europe except in Britain because that was a British tradition that uh, gave us this name in India. 1930s, when the Rationalist Association started, Britain had uh, the famous Rationalist Press Association and people like Bertrand Russell, Joseph McCabe were leading it. And the Thinker's Library series books were reaching all around the world, especially in English. And that has been the major inspiration that we had in India in the early 1930s. 1930, when the Indian Rationalist Association began, it was a very, very small organization. We had uh, 27 members at the time. And of course, amongst them were very prominent people. The founder was Dr. R. P. Paranjpai, who was uh, a professor at that time in the Bombay University. Later, he became a vice chancellor of Bombay University and the High Commission of India in uh, Australia, but the organization got defunct when the Indian independence struggle started. When it became very, very serious in 1940s, the organization got completely absorbed into that. But it was revived again in 1949. But this time, the first meeting of 1949 in December, we had less than 50 people. And it was, uh, of course, when we speak about 50 people, I'm speaking about a big country. I mean, the percent population in India is 1.2 billion. At that time, it was less than half of it, but still it was quite a lot. And now the organization has eventually grown, changed, and it's now functioning from a headquarters like this. This is the Rationalist Center in Delhi, which has been my, I mean, long-term effort, and we have a headquarters here. From here, we operate, we have a, 16 paid staff members in the Rationalist Association there. And uh, some of them work for the Rationalist International, some for the Indian Rationalist Association. And we have a publishing wing, namely Indian Atheist Publishers, which reaches out in, in uh, at least four Indian languages and publish some English books also. And some of the books have been so popular in India, uh, especially the classics of free thought. Ingersoll, Joseph McCabe, and very recently we have uh, published an old classic, which we all know, Darwin's Original Species, again, first time in one of the Indian languages it appeared, and it's one of the best sellers in India, even now. So, but when we operate from the Rationalist Center like this, this has been coming into being just six years back only. Before that, we operated from the houses of some of our office bearers all the time. And uh, at the Rational Center, we have very prominent visitors many times. Sitting here is Paul Cutts at the center. That was his last visit to India. And he came to the Rational Center and addressed a small gathering there. And right of him is uh, myself and left of him is Inaya, uh, another famous rationalist in India. And uh, we are not sitting in this office and doing some work. The Indian rationalists have a special working strategy to counter the kind of enormous superstitions that is spread all around. And superstitions, when we speak, um, the word superstition, what one generally think would be a cat crossing across your way and you turn back and because you think that it's a bad omen. It's not like that. In India, superstition means quite a lot. It's dangerous. People believe in superstitions to such an extent that uh, they are willing to even sacrifice some, sometimes their own children. They don't, they don't go to work or take a work or if it's an inauspicious time. 
people are so much dependent on astrology around 38% of the indian population is may, i mean driving their life through the astrological charts and marriages happening 65% of indian marriages as per one of the surveys are decided by astrologers if you find a lady or a gentleman the, then you have to go to the astrologer immediately and give the horoscopes he would decide whether you would be compatible or not if he says it's not compatible done the marriage is not happening and so many marriages don't happen because astrologers don't agree well of course nowadays people have found ways to bribe astrologers if one really wants to get somebody married uh, because you can interpret all these charts in any way you want but yeah, uh, in the rural areas we have holy men people thinking that uh, a lot of miracles happen all the time and most of the holy men claim that they have miraculous powers they show them real miracles and how they do most of the time it's pure deceit fraud cheating because most of these holy men know that they don't have any powers so they resort to simple sleight of hand and magical tricks and do it so we we found a very interesting way uh, this is my myself family in a village where i'm distributing uh, the small tablets of holy ash which is used by satya sai baba to produce holy ash we are training little children everywhere to do such things so that the future we find are in the younger generation of india why the young, younger gener- generation of india is important is another question we have a very young population in india the growth rate of population is very very high and the average age of an indian is less than 25 whereas in finland it's uh, 42.1 and in germany it's 45 because you have a almost equal death and birth here we are producing lot of new people and uh, i mean it's not, it's very very fast growing and it's expected that in another 10 years the average age and age of an indian would be 20 so we target these youngsters everywhere because after a few years they are the people who are going to be the big big majority in india but how do we do it one major pattern is we go to villages which i started when i was a student but now we have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers even now doing it somewhere they go to villages tell them about the local miracles and local superstitions tell them about the way their life is controlled by all this magical thinking tell them why the the the, the gurus and tantrics and the churches and the temples and the mosques control their day to day life and tell them how to come out to be presented in such a way not to provoke people but to speak on their side that how they are being exploited how they are being duped is the way we try to present we have never ever encountered any negative reaction from people so far never ever a rationalist campaign in a village was attacked imagine we have had thousands and thousands and thousands of meetings everywhere never ever, never ever it happened one of the major campaign patterns that we do is known as the rationalist reality theater you know the uh, the fear that people have about holy men about magical uh, happenings about uh, the auspicious time about uh, all 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 these kind of people and the miracles and all these kind of things by reasoning alone sometimes we cannot take them out of it because there is a fear the fear blocks them the more reasoning more explanations we give the more powerful the blockage comes it's difficult sometimes when people are completely blocked in their mind so very very casually very without much thinking we developed a strategy to counter this thing which later uh, many people have uh, explained that this could be one of the best ways to counter uh, i mean cognitive dissonance you know what is cognitive dissonance uh, if for example if you believe in uh, uh, the, i mean that the earth is going to end on a special day and if there's a small sect or cult believes in that thing so seriously and dedicates their complete life and sell off all their wealth and prepare for that thing 
and when the earth does not end on that day how will they react will they stop this belief or will they think that oh i've made a mistake it was stupid no their basic tendency would be to defend their belief so vehemently than earlier to argue it so fanatically that there was some technical mistake but it was correct because they have invested a lot of time energy thought fantasy and imagination to fulfill i mean towards this belief so when it is gone they are completely lost so they make a blockage immediately and they, that is known as cognitive dissonance to break cognitive dissonance reasoning alone is not possible so we the best way one of the best ways is the fear has to be taken out there are many advanced psychological ways to take it out but one of the ways that we developed it was we would send a, a holy man to the village but not a real holy man but a dressed up person a rationalist a trained young man who would behave like a holy man who go to the village and tell that uh, we have a million villages and everywhere still working they go to the village tell the people that oh he is a holy man there will be one disciple and he would show you all those magical things produce holy ash maybe he want to relax and a nail bed is brought and he would relax on the nail bed it's all a very simple basically and then he would show bring a coconut and break the coconut and of course some blood comes out of it and he said bad omen for the village people believe all these kind of things and once they believe to such an extent that they are willing to give anything for him he would say that well i am going to make a temple for your good luck bring all the money first of all, first of all he show a small example he asked somebody to give some money so somebody would give a 10 rupee ru- rupees indian uh, currency a 10 rupee currency so he would move his hand and turn it into a 100 rupee currency so anything given is 10 times multiplied so he show it two three times a small sight of hands which any magician can easily do and people are very convinced then he says bring all your gold all your wealth all your money and put it for the temple and it will be multiplied and people just run back to their homes and bring all their gold and money really it happens and that's moment that's you know that's the moment when we really show the people that you know they can go to any extent one of our trained young boys or girls will stand up and say that but what you have done is not anything very special i can also do it people are completely stunned and i mean shocked so then the young boy or girl normally a, a 15 or 16 year old young activist would be there simply starts doing everything that the holy man has done because both are trained by us only and then people are completely confused holy man would shout and argue and the people don't react normally people are completely stunned because they many of them really thought that maybe this is not correct but they didn't have the courage but the young person has the courage and counter it and when the countering begins and there is an argument goes on then at a very special moment the holy man takes off his wig and says that i am a rationalist you know what that moment happens people break into laughter the laughter is coming is a relief basically the fear is taken off the fear for about the holy man fear of the supernatural fear about the mysticism is just taken off and that moment without their thinking the cognitive dissonance breaks and that they get courage to think and critical thinking the moment it rolls up then we don't have to do anything it goes by itself it it rolls and rolls and they can this one the moment they start thinking critically of anything then one need not further i mean monitor it it will go on and on and it works like anything and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of villages we have done this thing and uh, some of the articles that covered about this work for example los angeles times said that we have been making a silent revolution in india not seen by much people outside but india is changing many people have assessed it so this work work became very important but it's not only at village level look at this is an old picture uh this is a, a fire which some people are making this was made in 1982 it was a student then this was made with a small uh, i mean film camera in darkness that's why it's very bad quality but this made a dramatic revolution in our country there is a place in kerala southernmost state of india a huge hill and there's a pilgrimage place and every year in january something like 
25 million people come for this pilgrimage place. Why? Because they see a holy light on the skies on a particular day. On January 14th of every year, when the sun sets, on the skies appear a holy light, three times. And in the national radio in Kerala, if there's a life commentary on this thing, when it is witnessed three times, oh, the light has appeared, people are waiting for it, people are shouting immediately, and people are coming all the way, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away to see this thing. And uh, now televisions of uh, live telecast to show the holy light appearing, all the channels. And this particular holy light was not explainable for anybody, how it happens. Exactly at this particular star constellation happens, this, and, and the explanation that the temple people have is that the gods, Hindus have a lot of gods, gods are coming down with a small fire to welcome the, the deity of this particular temple. And that's the only explanation we had. And 1977, one young man, one young engineer, went, located this place and tried to identify what is exactly in this place. And he, he found a hill there which has higher altitude than this temple place, which cannot be seen in the night, in the evening, because it's on the uh, eastern side. So there's a shadow of the Shabarimala hill would cover this thing, and it looks like uh, sky. But if somebody lights something there, a huge lamp or something like that, it can be seen here. And he found in his eyes that a huge camphor fire is made by some people. And there is a, a monitoring, a radio commentary is there, the transistor they hear. And any moment now the holy light can come, then they light the camphor and they show it up. And put it immediately with a the blanket, then again light it and three times they show it. And he was completely shocked. And he screamed and cried, oh, what, 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 a, what a fraud you are doing. And he was thoroughly beaten up by these people. But he came down to tell the story and told us. I was a very, very young student at that time, I remember. Uh, this was much discussed in our organization. But 1982, nearly 300 young student rationalists decided to go to this hill and catch these people that had it. And we did it. And this was a picture taken at that time. And, well, we took photographs. We, um, and the whole sequence we have recorded, we came out with huge bromides and explained it in the whole state. That was in 1982. The state government insisted that it's a miracle because it's a state government run temple. And all these years it has been explained as a miracle. 1991, after I became the National General Secretary of the organization, we decided to have a march to this hill with 10,000 people. Otherwise, the chief minister of the state should publicly acknowledge that it's not a miracle, that they are, they are doing it. The chief minister publicly acknowledged one day before our march. But still, the media continued with the miracle. Two years back, I filed a case in the Supreme Court of India telling that this fraud cannot be perpetrated by a state government. And the Supreme Court now asked the state government to explain it. They have officially now declared that this is done because the media was it. Long fight. From 1977 to 2011. But now we got it. It's, it's finally known by everybody that this miracle is over. So sometimes it's long struggle, but millions and millions of people are cheated by these kind of things. And that's, you know, the collection of this temple, it's uh, uh, something like, if you uh, turn it to euros, uh, something like uh, 18 million euros are collected by the temple around this I mean, pilgrimage season. And more money is collected in other ways, like the shops are auctioned and a lot of other money is there. So it's quite a lot of money. So now the money has started coming down. It's around 25% down already. Excuse me, I forgot to say that there's coffee for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Look at that coffee. So 1995, we, uh, we decided to take out our campaign to Na at, a, at a national level, and uh, this was known as uh, a, 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 a major campaign that I've been involved, uh, and uh, we decided to cover a thousand villages in, in hundred districts in India. And imagine, I mean, um, we all were young professionals, or I mean, a lot of students and all, 18 people, we decided, we all took off from work or studies or everything, got in a one, 
and went to villages and villages and villages and explained. We went to the villages, talked to people, understood what was their local miracles happening there. Then our young boys and girls shown it to people how it's happening. Like for example, a holy man comes and shows fire in his mouth. So our boys would show the same fire. This is uh, unbelievable, but it's reality. It's possible to do this thing. This is a young rationalist, and they put a camphor on the tongue and just lift it and put it inside the mouth. All what they have to do is they have to slowly exhale, not inhale, in a very slow way, because then there is a passage of carbon dioxide on the top and down, and it doesn't hurt you. It's a small technique; needs a little training only. And if it, after two minutes or three minutes, when it starts hurting, you just have to block off some air because it's carbon dioxide and it's gone. Nothing happens. But it looks amazing and when a holy man does this thing, people are simply falling for it. And we have done this, not, and uh, this is uh, from a documentary named the Guru Bastes, the Channel 4 of British, uh, I mean British television, Channel 4. They came all the way uh, to India and traveled with us for several weeks and made a documentary, three episode documentary namely Guru Bastes, this is a poster of Guru Bastes. But not only in the, in the campaigns like that. This is a very famous television program. Probably you must be knowing about this thing. This is a holy man who tries to kill me on a television program. Because uh, in 1990s, we have been very active uh, in villages. We have been going from village to village to reach out people. But the uh, last seven years, we are going from television studio to television studio to address larger audience. Because I am, for example, invited on an average, maybe for 200 panel discussions every year. Almost every second day I have a television program. And uh, every evening I would be ending up in a television studio most of the days. And uh, one of the days, when, when, when uh, the background picture you see is of a lady, that's Uma Bharati, the former chief minister of Madhya Pradesh state in India. She claims one day that she has a lot of problems because her political opponents are doing black magic on her. What are the problems? Her uncle has died as if no uncle would die ever. Or she had a small car accident and she had some ulcers on her feet. All because there's a political opponent doing black magic. And imagine a chief minister of a state making a press statement and saying that thing. And I remember that evening because um, I, I, I just came back home and the chat called from which a television channel came. We have to start a show in 30 minutes. And it's 20 minutes drive from your place and the car is already on way. Uh, and just rush to the studio because the sh show starts immediately. So I thought I should have a coffee now. But uh, there was no time for it and I rushed for the program. And of course, on the other side of the panel discussion was this uh, right person. He was Pandit Surendra Sarma, that was his name. He's no more in public scene. He was a very popular television astrologer and uh, holy man, tantric, uh, appearing in almost every channel at that time. And they called this person on the other side. He claimed normally that he was the guru of some of the cabinet ministers. And of course, when the program began, he said, look, I, I said the black magic and witchcraft and all are begone beliefs and I mean, it has no meaning. But this guy, I mean, with his white clothes and all, I mean, such a commanding voice, he said, it works. I have done it. I know that people can be killed by that. Thing. And I know it so well and I know the mantra to kill people. I've done it. I said, did you kill anybody? He said, no. I have uh, tried it on a dog. It has died immediately, in three minutes. And any human being, if I try, he would die. And I know how to recover a person also just before the death. Okay. I was completely stunned. Not because of uh, his claim and I believed in that thing, but the impact of this thing. Because this was a program which was seen by at least five, six million people in the evening one of the most popular television channels which reaches all of the rural, rural northern India. And how can I counter such a thing? I can make any kind of argument, I can say that it's, it's, this is a, a, a baseless belief, I can argue, I can say that this is not correct, you are telling me wrong. No, it doesn't work. I thought, just a flash came in my mind. I thought, there's a good way to counter it. I said, if that's correct and if you can kill anybody in three minutes, just kill me. Right this moment, kill me. He said, what are you telling me? You are, you are asking you to be killed. I said, yes, come on, kill me this moment. 
If you don't kill me, I would declare publicly that you are a fraud. You made a wrong statement. I provoke him so thoroughly. I mean, sometimes I'm very good at provoking people. And uh, after some minutes, he chanted his mantra upon me. Tried, he said three minutes, but nothing would happen in three minutes. And uh, ten minutes and fifteen minutes and half an hour and it goes. The channel decided to stop the next programs and they announced breaking news and continued it. And all the next programs were cancelled and went on for three hours. And he every time asked for ten minutes or fifteen minutes. And uh, at the end of three hours, he said it doesn't work. But uh, I am sure that he must be protected by some other gods. I, then I said that, look, I don't believe in these gods, I am an atheist. So he said, okay, uh, in that case, there is an ultimate ceremony, which has to be done in the midnight, in an open place, in a burial place. You have to come there at 11 o'clock, and if I do that, eh, you have only nine minutes. And it's a one hour I mean, session of tantric uh, ritual. In between, I will have nine minutes for you. In this nine minutes, when I chant this special mantra, first three minutes you will go crazy, unreversible. Next three minutes you go unconscious, unreversible. Next three minutes you will die. Okay, I said fine, that's perfectly fine. But in the first program, what we did was, you know, if you see, he tries to hold my forehead every day and shake it so well. I said, you don't do that. And you said to kill me with magic. For that, you need not touch me. So, but he pressed my forehead. Whenever I say that, I mean, don't physically touch me, then he said, you are afraid. Okay, some, so, some of it, I love it also. It looks so interesting that he shakes my forehead. And, I mean, it's on YouTube. You can see Tantra Challenge and you can see it. I mean, it's, in a, it's a long program, but it's cut short into four or five minutes of three episodes and you can see it in the YouTube. And anyway, but at one time of the program, he said, Sir, bring a knife. That was a little different, because I thought uh, he's trying to kill me with magic, and this time he wanted a knife. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I was not very, very comfortable about thinking that he brings a knife now. Uh, though I felt little uncomfortable, I did not express it, but somehow I had a little humor even at that time. I said, that's a conventional way of killing, I said. You, you promised to make a, a, a show of uh, magical killing. For that, no knife is required. Anyway, the knife came. Then he played the knife in front of my eyes and neck and I mean, tried to I mean, show that he would hit me or something like that, mainly to scare me. Maybe he wanted me to say, no, 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 stop or something like that. That's enough for him that I asked him to stop. But I, I, I was sure that I mean, in a television program, even if he hits me with a knife, I would be taken to a hospital immediately. So I just laughed and laughed and that was the biggest uh, or better strategy that I could use at that time. And at the end, the, the final ritual was promised and the final ritual was announced by the channel so vehemently. They advertised in all channels, will rationally Sanalita Marugo survive this night or will he fall to the mantras of the holy man? And uh, well, at 11 o'clock it started and he made fire and uh, the, the second part, the, the final ritual is here with fire and all he starts. And uh, then he made a small dough of wheat and uh, asked me to touch on that thing, then he boil it, boil it, heat it, and uh, cut it, stab it, a lot of things he has done, put a lot of mustard in the fire, smoke and color and light and all these kind of things. And uh, one hour has passed and uh, I end up clapping my hands and, well, I mean, the tantric was out of business. But you know what happens? Um, at the end of the program, he said, but you die this night. It has an impact, you will die this night. Next day some journalist asked him, he said, in three days you will die. You know, by a coincidence, if I had a car accident or a heart attack, he would have taken full advantage of that thing. I've been extremely careful. I even did not take my car back to home. I took a friend's car and left my car there and took another car because I was afraid, not of the mantra, but of an, an effort to kill me with some other methods. So after he said 27 days he has given, now some years have passed. I mean, how many years? Four years, five years have passed now. Nothing has happened so far. But any day, one time, I would die. Then if he's still alive, he would say that my mantra worked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, such a program, I mean, of course, the, the, the interesting side of the program was one side, but it has taken off fear in thousands of minds of people, maybe millions of people. It had the largest ever viewership 
in Indian television history, this particular program. This was, uh, I mean, still a record to be broken, but uh, that has made our position quite well in India. But miracles are still still happening everywhere. This is Mumbai. This is near a Muslim Darga in Mumbai. All these people came to take water from the sea because the sea water turned sweet. And one night, it's, there was a small mosque nearby and the, um, some boys found that the water is not more salty there. It's sweet. And immediately the mosque announced that it's a Allah ka Krishna. It's a miracle of Allah. And people started rushing and came in television and people started collecting this water in bottles. And claims came that stomach ache has gone, illness has gone, flu has gone, arthritis has gone. And somebody who has not been walking for several months have walked now and you know everything is miraculous. Cancer has gone so suddenly, everything has gone. And now the television channels asked me to comment on this thing. I had no answer immediately because I don't have ready-made answers for all these questions. I said I don't have an answer. But rather, I would, my approach would be very simple, to collect this water, send for chemical analysis, and see what would be the content of it. And till then, I would advise the Mumbai authorities to tell people not to use this water, stop it. It could be industrial wastage. It could be natural emissions coming from down. It could be toxic material. It could be anything. <coughs> or somebody is doing a prank. No one knows. But police or authorities could not stop the people. You know, people came like a like huge crowd. They took water and drank and, I mean, I mean they continued and continued like that. Many people collected it and took it for home and gave their ill parents or grandparents. And the chemical analysis reports came. You know what was it? There is a river, five kilometers away, Viti River, going to the sea. In old times in Mumbai, the city wastages were not uh, treated properly, but it was just pushed in the river, which goes to the ocean. Toilets simply went into the uh, river. In Mumbai city, it's all done, almost everything is now uh, I mean, properly done. But in the suburban small, small towns are still pushing into the river. It's still in the process of, I mean, with uh, 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 treating the city wastage, it's still in the process. So this city wastage coming from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of toilets, which is pushed to the uh, river, which goes to the off sea, but there was a water current that brought it to the shore of uh, this place. Uh, and then the coliform bacteria content in this water was 18 million times more than human tolerance. It was just human toilet leakage. And we know that it's not very sore, but uh, slightly sweet now. And a lot of people got diarrhea. Mumbai had terrible diarrhea in the whole area after this. Still nobody, still many people would say that it was a miracle. Still many people said that it was a miracle. See, look, it has turned sweet and it has now gone sore. That's how miracles are with people's minds. You know, in, it's in a, con in a country where we have so many religions coexist. We have uh, Hinduism, we have Jainism, Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, and more other religions also which are not here. We have even a small Jew community um, in down south in uh, uh, southern India. And most of the, these religions uh, try to dominate the Indian sea despite their number. For example, Hinduism is no single religion. It has so many different castes, hierarchical castes, which do not respect or accept each other as one community. Next, it's several different castes only. And a lot of people, out of 60% are backward communities, some are untouchables, and still they all call it Hinduism. And there are more than 3,000 gods for Hindus. And uh, Jainism is another religion, which is almost an agnostic religion by theory, but practically they have taken a lot of Hindu belief system. Uh, Buddhism in India has two elements. One is the earlier Buddhism, which has gone very ritualistic. A new sect of Buddhism came, the Dalits, leaving Hinduism, a joint Buddhism uh, in 1940s, made their number very high. Islam is around 16, 16.5%. 
we have a larger population of Muslims than the entire population of Pakistan. And Sikhism, another new religion, which has no gods, they worship a book only. Uh, that's an, another interesting aspect of how religions can evolve. All the knowledge of different religious texts were written in one book by the gurus of this religion in the beginning. And then when the last guru has gone, the book is kept in the altar of the temple and they worship the book. It may be symbolically meant the content of the book. But you know what they do? Nobody reads this book. The book is kept there, somebody recites it without even understanding what it is and people make huge fine fans and fan the book and touch the book and I mean, fold their hands to it. And it's taken as almost like a deity. You know? The book is a deity. That's that's, that's Sikhism. That's a religion where people have turbans and all these uh, knives and all. Sikhism has five major uh, uh, symbols of this religion which everybody has to follow. One is to have a knife because they have been fighters earlier. But some time back that was a problem because if you are sick, you are allowed to carry a knife all the time. But if you go on an aeroplane, you are not allowed. They had a big fight that they should be allowed to I mean, take care of big sword of knife on an aeroplane, which is not allowed, of course. Look at the, a Hindu temple. All different gods. So many different gods are in most of the temples. Many temples, there must be one major deity and there must be sub-deities. So, for example, for wealth, there is a god. For education, let's say, there is another god. For destruction of enemy, there is another god. So, whatever, you, can, you know, it's like a, you can decide what kind of service you want and you can decide what kind of gods you have to please. So this uh, pattern is simply acceptable. But new temples are emerging. This is Akshardham temple in uh, near Delhi. It has been constructed over five, six years and enormous money has been spent. One of the most uh, marvelous constructions in Delhi now and uh, almost like a corporate structure, how it is being handled. They, they don't really worship the normal Hindu gods. One of the gurus that's gone is the central part of this, this cult. But uh, some of the festivals are still very colorful. This is Puri, Death Yatra. The gods are taken out for a procession. Every year they do that. Is. And this is huge chariots. And there are big uh, trucks here, which people are Here, these are threads and these people are pulling it forward and this huge, huge the gods are taken all around the city most of the, most many years there will be stampeds and there will be people dying and all but still that's done so people are so much involved in these kind of things or the kumbh mela festival this is this festival is supposed to be the largest gathering of people in the whole world in Allahabad, the where the uh, river ganges joins with the River Jamuna and supposedly a hidden river Saraswati also joins there. And this place, at an auspicious time, all these people come and take a dip in the holy water. And the first right to enter this water is for the, the naked sadhus. There are a lot of naked sadhus who are living in northern India, living in special areas. And they have the first right to enter in the water as per old tradition. These are the naked sadhus jumping into the water. And uh, auspicious time is important for this Kumbh Mela, but this concept of auspicious time is everywhere. Look at this advertisement, guaranteed immediate solution, privacy ensured, India's number one gold medalist astrologer Pandit Karan Sharma and his website is wellfamouspandits.co, then wellfamouslovguru.co, that's the key of astrology, because most of the people who go to astrologies are looking for compatibility of a spouse or a lover or if you want to win somebody you can there is a special astrological method known, namely Vasikarana you can win somebody with chanting some secret mantras if you believe in that thing and these people sell all these kind of beliefs and husband wife dispute love marriage family problems health problems court case divorce education immigration lottery shares giving you sleepless nights all other problems and privacy guaranteed and you can uh, go to him and everything is done. These kind of people are everywhere in India. We have uh, 
nearly 100,000 astrologers practicing in India. They are professionals. But the uh, other side, you have certain people like this. He has, he is no more existing. He is Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. A very interesting person. Because 1960s he came into prominence. That was an year which was important for India because scientific temper and scientific approach has shown India that it can bring results around this time. The great green revolution has happened. Agricultural production has enormously increased. Until 1950s India has been waiting for ships to come from other countries for our wheat and rice. But the great agricultural revolution using science for practical use, irrigation, water management, I mean, or, or flood control, a lot of techniques we have used. And uh, science has shown that food production is one of the best results that it can achieve. And India became so self-sufficient with wheat and rice. Now we have excess wheat and rice for several years in our go-downs. We export wheat and rice now. This has been in 1960s, followed by the white revolution, the dairy revolution. Milk and butter everywhere. These two revolutions have changed India at one side and shown that science can give results to people. But at the same time, same period, appeared two, three people, like Mahesh Yogi or Satya Sai Baba. All these people emerged at the same time. So I normally try to say that there are two Indias coexisting all the time. One is a progressive, modern-looking India with use of science and tech technology, help people to go forward, education, and further forward, the modern India. 20th century or 21st century India at one side, on the other side, there is a medieval India with these gurus and astrologers and tantrics and holy men, charlatans control. These two Indias are in a permanent conflict. In this conflict, we try to win on the side of science, common sense and reason. But this person was uh, very successful, you have to say, because he sold a technique which is known as Transcendental Meditation, TM. He was uh, very successful not only in India but abroad also. His disciples, Beatles, which gave him enormous credence at the time. And uh, he made centers everywhere in the world and got a lot of disciples, mainly from the West, and taught people how to fly. This, are his, this, this is from a brochure of uh, Mahesh Yogi. This is what he te teaches. If you study transcendental meditation, and if you chant certain mantras continuously, you would levitate and you can fly. And all for global peace. If you levitate and lose your weight, and lose your weight not, not in a modern way, but lose your weight, then the atmospheric uh, pressure and then you can go up. And then people really uh, believe that they could fly like this. So many people have paid money to get a mantra to fly. Can I just make an interjection? I, when I, in the 1970s, I was living in the United States in my early 20s. I paid, I don't know how much money in dollars for transcendental meditation training. I did not do the flying stuff. <laughs> <laughs> One normally pays that. I, because the flying stuff came later. Hmm. You know, there was this big thing about TM, and you got all that your mantra, your, your personal guru gave you your mantra tailored just to you. Just to you. And, um, but meditation in itself, not a bad thing. To sit quietly for 20 minutes, that's not a bad thing. A few years later, I started hearing about this flying stuff, unfortunately, and not yeah, what, what, to what, money at that time. What, what these people normally do is, you know, meditation can be seen in two different ways. If meditation is just taking long breath and remaining silent for long hours, fine, that's tranquility. But most of the people who sell meditation speak a different thing. You can achieve greater things. For example, what they say is Akhanda Paramananda is what you can achieve. The un undividable, uh, eternal bliss, what you feel. So what they have, strange theories, that you have uh, a, a secret uh, roll of uh, snake on, under your spine, somewhere there, I mean, near your testes, and it goes when you meditate through your spine, and it blossoms on the head, and that is Kundalini. And this, this magical imagination of this thing, people get uh, a kind of great happiness, apparently, of auto-hypnosis. 
And but Mahesh Yogi was the first person who said that he could get people really fly and levitate. And a lot of people did that thing. And the money he charged was, in every meditation there was a special charge for him. The, for transcendental meditation, I think he was charging $2,500 at that time. And this is from a brochure. And uh, this is, there's a Switzerland, there's a school for flying teaching. Here are students flying. You know how they do it? That's the most interesting thing. Uh, nobody has seen these people really flying. Only photographs are there. In, in, uh, when Mahesh Yogi was still existing, everywhere on his brochures and website and everywhere these kind of people were there. You know, huge full-page advertisements, these pictures were already shown. What they do is, these were spring mattresses they are sitting. They sit on a lotus position then hop up and up and up and up. Then the cameras are thick down here. When they go up, it's clipped. Next moment they fall down with the nose. And that moment is not shown. Uh, if I may say, we had a yoga flying uh, party in Finland briefly, in uh -huh. late 80s or something. And uh, in television, they were actually showing them bouncing. This side. Yeah. Yes. Bouncing is possible. You know, if it's a spring mattress, you can really bounce up and down. Yeah. Yeah, that's really possible. But that one need not have meditation. One can just have a beer and do it also. So here, uh, what, what was later accused by some of the participants was, he was giving a prasada before the meditation. Prasada is a special offering, uh, but what it included was something special, which was a little hashish. And the mantra is, you, you get a, not a default mantra, but a, a real special mantra for you, seeing you and talking to you, you get a special mantra. And one of the mantras, one of the disciples who have gone there and wrote a book later, he said, he got one, two words only, Om Kri. So, Om is a really holy word in India, supposed to be the, the first word or something like that. And this Om Kri, he, he has to repeat a million times, sitting in a dark room, in the basement, and in a closed room. And when he has to close his eyes and never open it, Kri, he completes a million times, then he would slowly go up. You know what happens? Very simple. See, it's a comparatively uh, closed room with less oxygen. When you have less oxygen supplied to your brain, you can fantasize anything. You dream, normally when you dream also, when there is less, less oxygen supplied to your brain. And when you repeatedly chant a mantra and you think that you are going to fly, you would feel that you would fly. You would fly and you would go out of the window and you look the city down and everything you can feel but only for you. One need not even have hashish for that thing. Just this mantra and this belief and the lack of oxygen would be sufficient. But he sold it. He says that uh, more than 100,000 people have already flown. That's what Mahesh will claim later. But uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, disciples that these people get in the Western world has, gave a lot, has given a lot of credence them in India. Most of the money that these people got also from the Western disciples. Another person is Satya Sai Baba, who has never travelled to the West, but had the largest number of Western disciples. He has gone only one time out of India in his life. That was Uganda to see his old friend, Idi Ami. And then he remained in India only. But uh, he had enormous clout. Enormous clout in the sense that in some of his birthdays, look at this thing, I mean, the left-hand person is the Prime Minister of India. Adel Bihari Vajpayee. And the right side is the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh where he lives. And uh, he blesses them. But in the, on his uh, uh, 78, 79th birthday or 80th birthday, there was a very interesting uh, situation that uh, the Prime Minister of India, P.V. Narasimha Rao, uh, the year I am not very clear, I mean, it was this particular period where Narasimha Rao was the Prime Minister, and Shankar Dayal Sarma was the president and Justice Bhagavati was the chief justice of India, Supreme Court. All of them were these disciples. The judicial, executive and the, uh, the government. The speaker was a disciple. The top businessmen and the Indian pop stars, the cricket stars were his disciples. So such a clout he had and he could simply control uh, a lot of politicians by, by his personal suggestions. And he was a god, very special god. He had a mission. He was, it was a trust that he was running, namely the Satya Sai mission. The only trustee in the trust was he himself. And the god himself signed all his checks. 
till his 80th year. Of course, when he could not sign, he became very old. Then he put in some more people as uh, the trustees, and till then he was the only person who was signing the checkbooks. And when he died, in his private bedroom, it was found, it was not accessible to people. The bed was made of pure gold, not gold plate, but pure gold. And under the bed, for emergencies, some golden big bars were kept. The top was completely studded with uh, diamonds and pearls. And of course, currency notes in huge gummy bags were put in the Almaras. From where did he get all this money? He did not do any legitimate work. And he had a, an annual turnover of more than several states of India. He had his own airport, his own railway station, his own post office, his own university, his own medical college. And that was one of the God men who claimed that he was God. He wrote, I am the God and I created this universe. And there were people believing that. And when he died, he claimed that he would die on his 96th birthday only. He predicted it so many times. But somehow, uh, the death did not wait as per his wishes. He came at his 84th year and he simply died. But on his... Uh, uh, I mean, his body was uh, I mean, publicly shot. Sitting with the turban is the Prime Minister of India. On the left is Sonia Gandhi, the President of the ruling party. He said she's an Italian, Italian Roman Catholic. But I don't know whether they believe in these kind of things. I'm sure whether they believe it or simply do it for political expediency, the result is the same. People take their leaders, take the public figures for granted, and what they do is simply giving credence to these kind of people, but not only them. Look at this person, that's APJ Abdul Kala, a scientist, was the president of India. Abdul Kalam visited Satya Sai Baba on his birthday. You know what Satya Sai Baba did mainly? He produced holy ash. He moved his hand and produced holy ash and gave to people. Or he blessed people, and many people say that I mean all their problems are solved by him. Or he would just, just spit golden shivalingas, the phallic symbol of Shiva, he spit out and show people. And he says that I produced it. You can see it on YouTube how he produces it. He just one can see it so well. He put it in a little towel and put it near his mouth and say that okay, I've produced it. So simple like that. And uh, APJ Abdul Kalam is not a simple person. He was a professor of aerospace engineering was the first chancellor of space, science and technology, was the 11th president of India, he got the highest civilian award, namely the Bharat Rekna, the Pearl of Bharat. That is Abdul Kalam. But what to say about that thing? Uh, not only Abdul Kalam, when we have, we have a space research institute, a very successful satellite communication system we have, Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, when it launches a rocket, imagine the chairman of the, uh, the, the, the research institute makes a replica of the satellite and the rocket and go to Tirupati temple and place it there and make a special prayer. Or, astrologers decide the time of the launch so that it could be auspicious. Or, to the next stage, the, the chairman of the, uh, uh, the scientific institute comes with a coconut, chants some mantras and break it in front of the satellite before launching because Lord Ganesha, the elephant-faced goat, has to be pleased for all obstacles being taken off. That's how science and superstition coexist in India. And uh, that's... Uh, people don't take this, you know, it looks like a joke, but in India it's all very normal. Look at this person, Amma. She has been in Finland last year. Amma is a very special person. Uh, she does not really speak even her mother tongue properly. She's an illiterate lady. It's not a, I mean, I'm not accusing her of I mean, her literacy or not. But uh, she is giving great lectures about uh, philosophy nowadays. You know what she does? She speaks some absurd words in Malayalam language. That's a mother tongue. There is an interpreter 
who has studied properly and who would make fine interpretations with a lot of quotations from Vedas and Upanishads and say that that's how she said it. She was even invited to the United Nations to speak. Imagine. And you know what is her major business? She just hurt people. Started at the age of 50, at the time of puberty, she had a problem, which is written in one of her own books. You know, India is a very, uh, very, very repressed society to many, in many parts, in rural areas especially. In, in schools, for example, girls and boys don't sit in one bench. In buses, women have separate seating positions. And if there is an empty seat near a lady, and if several men are standing there, nobody would sit on, a, on that seat. Because if somebody sits, she would stand up immediately. Because it's, it, that's how society is I mean, divided gender-based in many parts of India. In such a situation, uh, Sutamani, that was her name, in her early years, when she was in her teens, started with a small problem. She herself writes in her own book that everybody thought that she was crazy. And even her parents thought of taking her to a mental hospital. Because she would just hug anybody, especially boys. Anybody going nearby her little uh, house, she would just run them and hug them. And many people were so afraid and they run off. And then she would scream and cry and fall on the floor until the guy comes and allow her to hug. Then sometimes she would roll on his march. And then later she started a small prayer group. And you know, funny things. Like she would make a cardboard crowd uh, of a goddess one day and another cardboard crowd of a god on the other day and just dance crazily and sing some songs. Some people joined together to I mean, dance along with her. Like a village folk structure. But eventually she got a very strong manager. He made a, a trust out of her and he was looking for a, apparently a victim I mean, a, a godman who can be presented publicly as a holy person and who do not really think much or, or, or practically are, uh, uh, who is not able to handle things by herself. So this person is controlling the empire. He is the vice chairman of this institute. And uh, Amritananda Mai goes on hugging and hugging people. And people are thinking that, I mean, it's something very, very special. And uh, one feels so motherly nowadays, people say. She is now in her late 50s. But uh, quite some years back, uh, there were a lot of uh, how initially people were attracted was a, was a scandal almost at that time. Because she was sitting at that time at her uh, home, there was a small prayer room, and one by one the, the guys who are coming there for a prayer, he, she would call in the inside room and make a grand embracing and pat on the shoulder and, oh son, all your problems are over. So what is the nature of this hugging was a rumor at that time. And but one person, very famous writer in India, Kushan Singh, the very famous writer was the editor of Hindustan Times and the Illustrated Weekly and all. He wrote an article after visiting her. He was an agnostic. And he wrote in, an, in his column, very famous column in Sunday magazine, that I visited Amma. She was in her thirties at that time. And now I believe that she has a lot of powers. Real powers. I've experienced it. And you know then what he said? At age 86, I had an erection in two minutes. He wrote in this article. And imagine such a sarcastic comment. Uh, either one should file a defamation case. But what this ashram people did was, they take out the second part of it. And they said, I'm impressed. She has great powers. I'm convinced. And they put it in their advertisements. They, they really put it in, in, their, in their announcements that Kushan Singh, such an I mean, agnostic and well-known critic of all these people, has appreciated her and accepted that she has powers. The article will be reproduced later and then translated into several languages. Kushan Singh is a very humorous person. He said that, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he understood what was the whole mechanism, how it was functioning at that time. But now, it's presented as a mother hugging all, I mean, I mean, young children or something like that. It's a huge market. You know, the market now goes to a new level that the, the, the mission that uh, this lady runs, or in, run, in, run in her name, now try to sell small doors of Amma so that you can hug all the day. They have ordered um, huge quantities of uh, doors for European disabled now. 
next time when she comes, you can buy dolls also. So this is one kind of marketing. But you know, uh, what she does, okay, she does for her disabled. But she, we using this, this clout as a holy person, she has made a medical college, got a license to run a medical college. And in this medical college, the kind of corruption that is being done is not fitting for a holy person. To get an admission in a medical college, in a private medical college, you have to give huge bribes in India because medical seats are very limited there. Every private medical college run by religious institutions take a lot of money and that they made their income. And her medical college, the basic money that you have to give to get an admission is 60 lakh rupees. That comes to around 10,000 euros. Imagine, compared to the value of Indian rupees and difference of euros and euro and Indian rupee. And people who pay this money to her without a receipt, not by check, but black money under the table. I have publicly said it. I have witnessed, I have people, I mean, who have, I mean, whose children have paid this and recorded information I have with me. That's why I'm publicly saying it. They cannot even defend, I mean, defamation fire against me. And uh, this is done by this holy woman at one side. And the nurses in her hospital are signed for the real salary which is government strictly uh, insists to be paid for nurses and gives one-fourth or one-fifth of it actually because the salaries are not given to bank accounts like we, we do it here. In many places it's just given as cash. You sign for a huge, uh, the real amount which is to be given. Maybe for 15,000 rupees you sign and you get 4,000 rupees. And these nurses went in public and asked for giving the actual money they signed for. And they were handled by goons. The professional goons of the city were hired by this ashram and beaten these nurses. The televisions recorded this thing, the goons coming and beating these people, and the ashram people ordering them to beat them. Everything they were recorded and publicly came. But what, what's the result? Nothing. Next week there was a function of this holy woman in her ashram, and you have representatives and power members of different political parties going there because she commands votes. That's the sad side of Indian. And this is the hugging session. This is how he... Another holy man, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar was a disciple of Mahesh Yogi. He started his own business now. And he found a new way of meditation, namely Sudarsana Kriya. Everybody can make... But you cannot use that thing, it's patented and trademarked. And uh, this, uh, this special meditation involves a special kind of breathing technique. He, he says that well, the way we all breathe are, it's wrong. And through the Sudarsana Kriya only you can breathe correctly and properly. And therefore, you are taught how to breathe. And the breathing is taught against a fee. And a lot of people pay money for weekend sessions and study how to breathe properly. A lot of people, thousands and thousands of people. And uh, he sells very well. Another holy man. This is a very, looks funny, but uh, he is a very, very powerful person in India because he runs a television channel and appears on 24 television channels every day morning. And he teaches how yoga can be useful. Yoga is not as an exercise it's presented in India, it's linked with faith in India. You know, most of the superstitions in India are linked with faith or nationalism. That's how it becomes, you know, you cannot touch it, it's a holy cow suddenly. So he says, every kind of problems have a solution in yoga. And, and he interprets in special ways, by touching special parts of your body, you can invoke a lot of capacities in you. For example, this is one way how to keep your uh, age uh, controlled. You have to press here very much. Or, if you go to a metro in, in New Delhi, every day morning, you see uh, middle-aged women traveling for their walk will be rubbing their fingers like this. A lot of people will be rubbing. You know why? The yoga guru in the morning tells that uh, if you rub your fingers like this continuously, you will not become grey. And people believe it. They rub and rub. Or in this position, you can see a lot of people sitting in the parks in the morning. Or these are different 
positions that he said. But sometimes he can be very, very dangerous. When the swine flu was spreading all around the world, of course, the government of India has been very careful, making a lot of precautions, educating people. Televisions have been speaking how to cover your sneezing and all. But he came in his television program and said that this is all meaningless. There is a protection in yoga available. And there are certain mantras also. All what you have to do is you have to chant a special mantra and chew a special leaf, which is supposed to be a holy leaf. It's just another leaf only. And you have to chew that thing and chant this mantra and you are protected. Imagine how irresponsible this statement is. But you know, instead of booking him on Magical Remedies Act, the Delhi government next day started distributing these leaves all around, free of course. Because people wanted it. But he also claimed that chewing the, 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 the fresh grass of a wheat, you can protect yourself from HIV virus. But the danger involved is, is, that is where superstition becomes so, so dangerous. If you believe these kind of things, and people believe, and his programs sell, and his yoga classes are attended by thousands of people, politicians, chief ministers, everybody go there. And he started even a new political party recently, and he wants to become the president of India. Imagine what would be India's fate then. This is another guru, Prahlad Jani. He was very popular in news all around the world. I mean, I'm just showing some... Uh, uh, cross-sections of Indian polymen only. He said, for the last 70 years, he has not been eating food or drinking water. Imagine, I mean, something around the beginning of the Second World War, he stopped eating and drinking water. And we would, everybody has a small smile here and there. But, you know, government of India takes such things very serious. The Defense Ministry of Government of India decided to study about him. For example, if one can survive without water and uh, food, that would be very useful. If one studies this yoga and meditation, it's very useful. You know why? In the border of India, in Siachin, so many soldiers are there, I mean, in very high altitude. And their food is supplied by helicopters, food drops are there. It's quite expensive. If they can be taught this meditation, no food supply or water supply is required. Therefore, the Defense Research Institute has given a huge amount of money to a, 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 a hospital to study about this meditation and make a result out of that. And it was a, a, it was a scam basically. We asked that we should be involved in the, in the, in the study, but we are not allowed. They even claimed that I mean I, I was allowed to participate in this thing, but I was never allowed. And we found that he was actually not. Uh, kept away from water, he was allowed to take a shower every day morning and he was just gulping in one lot of water. And I mean, some of the nurses took pictures and brought it out and we gave in televisions later. Or other holy men, uh, these kind of people are at different parts of in India who show special uh, skills and capacities or the angry and furious people who say that they want a, a religious nation or people dress up like the Hindu gods, the monkey goat, for example, here, or people worship with their skulls and in, in the burial places, all these kind of people exist in India. This is all tolerated in India. This is all allowed in India and become a part of the Indian mindset, which is so influencing. And these tantrics sometimes claim that, I mean, they can give power to people by using special mantras and tantras, like the other guru has said. And some of the techniques involved in their books, uh, the internal organs of children. A lot of children are lost every year and suspected that most of the tantrics are kidnapping them or abducting them and killing them. So we counter all these kind of things in very different ways. For example, some of the tantrics show that they can walk with naked feet on the fire. Great powers. So we train our volunteers to do the same thing. This is a rationalist walking on the fire. Because when we tell that, well, these people do it very simply because if you walk over the fire, nothing happens. If you keep on walking, there is no sufficient contact with the fire embers and your feet and it does not hurt you. It's a very simple thing. So after this winter is over, I hope someday I will organize a, a, a fire walking in Helsinki so many of you can really walk on the fire. It's so simple. It's so simple. I've done it. Young boys and girls have been running over the fire and it's nothing. But... Uh, 
Only thing is that you should have a little confidence and you know the basic principle that you should not stop in between and look back. Then you know, then you have your contact with different. If you keep on walking, nothing happens. Like when, when it's a hot kettle, you can just take it with your hands. It doesn't hurt. Because there is let's say, no sufficient time of contact um, to, to communicate the heat. That's the same technique. But just by telling it doesn't work, we have to show it. Therefore, our volunteers are walking on a, on a fire in a fireplace and show it to people. Or when people levitate, uh, but this is a real levitation. Look at this thing. Here's a young boy, he's levitating. Uh, and standing behind me is me, and this is the National Science Center. I have a workshop every year in the National Science Center during the summer vacation for students. I'm a resource person there, and uh, there I train young boys and girls how to really levitate. Small techniques involved, of course, because this looks like real levitation and people, all the children around were completely astonished, but the boy and me knew what was the trick, trick which later were, was shown to the other people. Because here, this boy is not actually going up. He was first lying down. When I say up, he would just go like this. But here, he is sitting like this. And here in his hand is a hockey stick. He holds the hockey stick like this and sit only gives an impression that he is actually levitating. This is one of the ways to levitate, which many people do, and many, many holy men would do. So we, we show all these kind of things and train children, not only just telling that this is all, I mean, but make it a little interesting and showing children how exactly this is done, or to produce holy ash, or to just relax on a nail bed. For example, thousands nails put on a bed. For example, a, a table with uh, so many nails. And if you put an apple on that, thing, it will just pierce through it. But then the holy man, or anybody who wants to become a holy man, removes his shirt, go on that thing and just relax. Nothing happens because the weight is distributed. If you go on one nail, it hurts. But if you go on thousand nails, just the weight is distributed and nothing happens. Not even a small pinch you will get. So all these are really shown and trained to people by us. But sometimes it's not very easy when one explains this. This is, a, this is the famous crucifix in Mumbai, uh, which uh, made me land up in Helsinki. This crucifix, uh, here, some water drops started coming. Exactly one year back, March 1st of last year. Three days later, the first anniversary of this miracle class. And uh, on 5th of March, the, the television channels started reporting it and uh, everywhere there were a lot of uh, articles, newspapers were reporting. The church immediately said that it's a miracle because water was dripping from the feet. Jesus is crying and the water is coming down and falling through the feet. And they collected this water in small buckets and uh, glasses and distributed to people to drink. And they started a prayer group in front of this thing and the priest of the church came down, because this is outside the, the church building, and he stood under this uh, statue, the cross, crucifix, and hundreds and hundreds of people visit. And he makes several sessions of prayers there, reading from Bible. And people sit on their knees. And then, in a spoon, the, the holy water, which is collected from the feet, is distributed to people. And I sat on a television program on, on 5th of March. I was sitting in Mumbai, uh, in Delhi, and this this was happening in, in, in Mumbai. I said, I need not go and verify this thing. Why? Because it's common sense that no statue would release water without a water source. There could be some source somewhere. Maybe it has a hole somewhere and some natural rainwater has trapped into that thing. Maybe some other reasons. One has to study that thing. Normally, I would always say that take the water and send for analysis. You would understand what's the source. So no, they did not care for that thing. And uh, I said a lot of examples that a lot of places these kind of miracles are done. Crying Mary or weeping Jesus and everywhere. I don't know why these people are always crying and weeping, but uh, centuries they are crying and weeping all the time. Uh, but uh, it, it uh, does not come to common sense. So the, the television channel who did the program and the church itself said that without empirical evidences you are making allegations. It's a miracle and you should come and really see it. Without which, whatever you say is uh, 
uh, a kind of criticism without really studying. I said, yes, if you say that thing, I would come, but I would, generally I don't want to really come to these kind of things everywhere because open mindedness does not mean that you have such a big hole in your head that your brain falls down. It, 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 you know, for example, suppose somebody says that I have my head in my hand, I need not go and refute it because it's common sense to understand that it's wrong. So anyway, I've gone to Mumbai. I took permission from the church to study about this thing. When I went there, there was a prayer going on. The priest of the church was in front of this uh, crucifix, reading from Bible, and nearly 300, 400 people were standing in front of that thing, and they were all praying. I waited till the prayer is over. Then I asked them, should I now verify? Yes, I was uh, given the permission. Then, very interestingly, as if they wanted to really track me, the priest brings a small uh, hammer to me and said, that, why don't you hit the statue and see whether some water is trapped in that thing. I suddenly understood what was the intention. If I take the hammer in my hand and make a small hitting, there can be five photographs made at the time, and next moment they would say that we didn't permit and we tried to damage our deity. So that's a very serious offense. I just go there and with, with a hammer damage the deity. I said, I don't want to I mean, do such an exercise. Rather, I would verify it in a very different way. And I just verified the whole area. And uh, the first thing that I noticed was a very simple one. Behind the, I went behind the uh, building, uh, the, the wall. And the, the, whole, the whole wall was completely dampened with the water presence and algae. Which means there was some water coming to the wall from somewhere. And one cannot see anything down there. So somewhere the water was coming on the wall. Then I went uh, further and found that the nearby wall, here you can see the crucifix also, the nearby wall is also wet and there is no water source at the top. I looked for the water source. Then I found a toilet behind it. And the toilet had of course some water tank at the top and it was leaking and the water was coming, it was a little dirty toilet. And then I looked where the water is actually going. Then it went through a pipe and I followed the pipeline and I found that just behind this statue, this crucifix, behind this uh, wall, it goes down under the earth to be connected to the main sewage line. So, but it was covered at that part with a flat uh, uh, I mean stone sheet. So I opened it. It was full of dirty water can see the whole dirty water. It was at least three, four feet down. It is full of dirty water clogged there. So the dirty water clogged there, naturally water when it is not allowed to go further forward, it climbs through small pores upwards. That's known as capillary action. That's why we have, uh, if toilets are not covered with, uh, 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 I mean, proper stones, you get wetness at the top. Or during rainy season, the, the buildings normally get water going up or trees getting water. It's all through capillary action. So I further see that thing and it is so dirty, so stinky, quite a lot of water and I could not bear and I, I had to close my nose. But I took photographs of course recorded, I went out again. Then I found here is, uh, if there is water above his knee, this, this feet, I touched the feet, there was no water presence. But there was a nail and there is water. One, one could touch water there. And under the nail there is water. <coughs> so it was very clear that the, like on the wall, the water came, I mean, like on the wall, on the cement base, it has come up. And since there was a nail hole here, it simply drained out. And from the nail, it simply came down. That's why there was no water at the top. And there was water on the nail and it was down there. And I touched the nail and smell. It had the same smell. So it was very clear. It was pure, dirty toilet water again, which was given to people. And it was, you know, when I was waiting for my opportunity to study this thing, I was also, they brought it for me also to uh, drink. You know, there were people who have been taking it, their thing, I mean, palm like this, and just licking it. And uh, that was the holy toilet water. And, and uh, the, of course, I didn't explain it to the, the crowd there. They wanted me to talk to the crowd. I spoke about scientific temper and importance of explanation. Now, apparently the, the priest understood what was happening. This is the priest. He was sitting, folded head, uh, headed and, uh, and later he all came in the evening television program. The television program, 
there was a very interesting discussion. Ten minutes were given to me to explain the miracle. I have explained the charts, photographs, and similar uh, all all material and all. I have explained it so thoroughly, and I have shown also photographs of how they have been distributing this holy water and pictures of this lake with the holy dripping uh, with a miracle name on that thing. Everything I have explained. But five members of the church were on the other side in the panel discussion. I was all alone. The priest, an advocate of the church. The trustee of the church, some organizations, three days, five people, five people on one side and me on the other side, and I tried to explain it, and they shouted me. Of course, I got ten minutes properly to explain, and that ended the miracle. Next day onward, there was no miracle, of course, it ended. And they argue and argue and shout and shout and tell that the capillary action is wrong. Water will never go up; it goes only down. Gravitation is the only thing that I mean takes water forward. I said you have to study at least school textbooks. So this argument goes on, and but I was very convincing despite the shouting of these people. Half an hour later, the bishop himself wants to be in the program. The bush, bishop of Mumbai comes in the program on a phone line, and uh, he wanted to talk to me. The television program continues, and the bishop says that you are ignorant. That was the first statement he says. I said, uh, I do not know, Mr. Bishop, your name. I mean, can you can you tell me why you are told, uh, uh, calling me an ignorant person? Because you do not know that the Catholic Church has been promoting science and uh, I mean scientific knowledge all through the centuries. The Pontifical Scientific Institute has been responsible for scientific growth in Europe. I could not stop laughing really. I, 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 I just laughed for some minutes. Then I said, look, I don't want to counter this thing. But I would like to bring two witnesses on my side, put it theatrically, from history. One would be Leonardo Bruno whom you have burnt to death. And one, the other would be Galileo Galilei. And whom you have put in prison for 12 years because his scientific information was not tenable to Bible knowledge. Then the bishop, you know what he said? Do you know that Galileo at the end has apologized? You have to apologize too. Well, that was, I said, I don't apologize. Very simple. You see, what you say is absurd. And this kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, controlling of people with fear and threatening does not work with me. I don't apologize. I can be corrected if I'm wrong. I'm not, I mean, I don't, I'm not a dogmatic person. I can make mistakes. If I am correct, if, if I am informed with correct information, I am open for correction. But I would not apologize for something I am so convinced about. Either you have to correct me with facts, or you have to apologize for distributing this dirty water to the people, I said. Um, then also I said, you know, look at the whole concept, the crucifix being shown as a source of holy water which can cure people. The whole concept is absurd. See, why, why for example, one of the uh, commandments say that one shall, one shall not worship a statue. And what about a crucifix? Is it not a statue? Doesn't it contradict it to your own belief system? I put on some questions like this. Or logically, why do you worship a cross? For example, if Gandhi is respect, to be respected by somebody, would one worship the gun that has been used to kill him? Rather, there is another reason for cross worship. That was a reason historically to be seen that it was a symbol of sun worshippers before the I mean, Christian period. And when the sun worshippers and the Mitra religion people were absorbed into Christianity, their symbol of sun's rays, I mean, shown as, I mean, with olive branches, was taken as a symbol of Christianity, to absorb them into Christianity. That's why Sunday is important. And if you know history, if you know religious history, you would understand that. When Catholic Encyclopedia speaks about this thing, Bishop says, you are ignorant, you don't know anything. I said, see, you can continue saying that, but uh, your own popes have apologized for many of the mistakes that you say now. I said about John Paul II, it was apologized for uh, many of the mistakes that they have done historically. He said, no pope has ever apologized. They are infallible. I said, you have to study about Catholicism. That's the only thing I can advise you. And the discussion goes on. And he became so angry. And he said, we shall teach you a lesson. And then he goes on. The other people immediately say that, I mean, we will put a lot of cases against you. We will see that you don't see sunlight again. Every case, police stations in Mumbai will put cases against you. I, I asked them also, if I, if I made wrong statements, you can go with a case against me. A defamation case you can put. You can prove that I'm wrong. But they didn't go for a defamation case. 
and I would have proved what, what I said was correct. They have misused a law, Article 295 of Indian Penal Code, which is meant for uh, stopping people making malicious campaigns or, or with malicious intention damaging somebody's religious sentiments. Again, this law is absurd, contradictory to freedom of speech at one side. But this law, why they misused? Instead of going, f if, if they were unhappy, if they think that I have defamed them, they could have gone for a defamation case. That's the courageous position if they want to defend their position. But why, why they misused this case was very simple. That this law has a problem. The problem is very simple that it does not need a court of law to arrest you. Without an arrest warrant, you can be arrested. The moment a police officer is convinced that this prima facie, this charge is verifiable, he has full power without going to a court of law to arrest you and put you in prison and it's non-bailable. Of course, you can go for an anticipatory bail. I didn't take all this thing very serious because I, am, I thought, I mean, I'm powerful enough and that I've uh, I'm exposed uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of miracles so far and uh, I'm in the television, I'm talking to people and how can some people, I mean, also this is my fundamental duty as per the constitution to promote scientific temper and critical inquiry as per the constitution. So how can one use that against me? But they really went with this law and 17 police stations, they have filed cases against me and 15 police stations outright rejected it. But the bishop could convince two police stations. The office says, charge the case. And of course, still I didn't take it very seriously. But I, my lawyer said that you should go for an anticipatory bail application. Anticipating a wrong case against you and you want a bail in advance and offer yourself in the court of law any day. So the, my anticipatory bail application was rejected by Delhi High Court. With a technical ground. Nobody wanted to touch religion. They said, um, well it's in Mumbai, why don't you go to Mumbai, not in Delhi. But we have shown a lot of proceedings. I stay in Delhi. And I can ask for uh, my protection in Delhi. So Delhi High Court insists that you should go to Mumbai. So my lawyers go to Mumbai. They file a, 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 a I mean, case for anticipatory bail there. They, the, everybody wanted to push the ball to the next person. The Delhi High, the Mumbai High Court said, look, it could be right, but you go to the lower court first. And if they reject it, you can come back to us again. Rejected again. But you know, the more anticipatory bail application is a problem. The moment an anticipated bail application is rejected, the moment you can, when you come out of the court, you can be simply arrested immediately. Because the court has said bail is not possible. Then you have no scope for a bail after that. And I didn't go for the court. I know I, I was planning uh, how to handle it in a very different way. I thought I would not really go into uh, a prison, but rather I would go through the whole legal process, go to the lower court and try it at the level best. And uh, my lawyer said that uh, now uh, it's, a, it's a very tricky legal game. Anybody can simply come and arrest you. And they can put a small technique that they can make a small demonstration against you. And the prosecution can simply say that for your protection, for your security, you should be kept in prison. That's precisely what the, uh, some people argued in the, in the Delhi High Court also. It would be safer for me to be in prison. Otherwise, the angry Catholics could attack me. But in fact, there was no angry Catholic, I mean, fighting against me. It was two fanatic groups, and behind them was a bishop only. And the, the Indian Bishops Conference is so seriously against me for a long time, because I provoked them, of course, for quite some reasons. One was my criticism on Mother Teresa. I said that, uh, not... Uh, one of the, my major criticism was the money collected for Mother Teresa's institute. It's not really spent for the poor people, it's spent for building up institutions. I was, of course, quoting Christopher Hitchens with his famous book with the facts and, the, and the one, one former treasurer of the institute writing a book about the whole thing and was also quoted. Another thing was the miracle mongering of the church. Mother Teresa, for example, was not made a saint because of the work that she has done. But because somebody, some lady claimed that she had a tumor in her stomach and she put a picture of Mother Teresa there and the tumor has gone. That's why she was made a saint. Imagine. And this lady had a surgery for a tumor already. She never, she can only write Bengali language and she wrote a wonderful English language statement making this thing. 
and uh, of course later now she now withdrawn the statement telling that uh, they promised a piece of land for me and the land was not given at the right place therefore it was a fake statement now she says anyway mother teresa was made a saint all the way so other other good example was uh, sister alfonsa in kerala she was made a saint recently you know one this one district in india has 48% of catholics they are one nun who was just another nun who died at the age of 37 was made a saint and uh, the catholic schools in this district i mean gave dress of nuns to little girls and made a demonstration in the streets with these girls with nuns dress i wrote an article in one of the magazines in india which was a very popular magazine outlook magazine telling that this is uh, uh, a strategy to recruit future nuns because the number of nuns are going down everywhere in the world average age of a nun in united states is 74 now the, the, the percentage of nuns have gone down around 40% it has gone down in the last 20 years and most of the nuns who are working around the world and nearly 50% of come from india and of this 50% 92% of the nuns who go from india are coming from this one district namely kotte and that's where you make a nun as a saint and force young girls in the schools to dress up as nuns this is nun exportable and nun recruitment that's what i said so that was hitting on their fundamental resource because nuns are the biggest economy source for the church they work and they don't get salary the church institutions run with that so the church was making and op- looking for an opportunity to i mean trap me and uh, to an extent they have been successful one can say because i had to go in hiding for some time then i heard that of course uh, uh, the mumbai groups are trying to hire mafia to kidnap me to Mo- mumbai and i mean arrest me there or they are both discussing about get me in prison for one night and uh, pay enough money to a co prisoner to stab him to death all these kind of things were being discussed so then i decided well i travel to europe i was going for a lecture tour at that time in in uh, uh, poland i was invited already then i talked to my friends and my friend pekka yellow uh, the president of finnish university student who is a old french he said come to finland early and i came some days earlier in finland but when i was in finland and then i went to poland poland i been one of the strongest catholic i mean power holders i been lecturing about catholic church and then i heard that at my home police have been already there in such a thing on july 14th so now the situation is very simple that if i uh, the, the police is not bringing the case to the court of law now because if it's in the court of law i can ask for a bail but if it is not in the court of law and if it's in the investigation stage the police officer has full say as per this law he can arrest me and i need not get a bail that is one one serious problem on the other side how can we counter it we try two three different ways one is forcing catholic church to make it shameful for them and forcing them to withdraw this case uh, the british rationalist association made a signature campaign a petition and in two weeks or three weeks they got 12000 signatures and that was sent to vatican and to the bishops conference of india no response the interestingly some of the catholic leaders some late leaders came out and they said that this is absurd we have been speaking against uh, this kind of suppressive laws and when we ourselves use this thing it's absurd no no response so they want to use this as an opportunity to they think that i mean i can be stopped but what they do not know is that i cannot be stopped because uh, while i am in europe i have been traveling all around i have been to ireland another catholic center i have gone there and exposed one major miracle there also the moving mary of uh, batten spitel for example there is a mary statue which they claim that it's moving all the time people say that oh the mother mary is moving the statue on a hill and what i did was when i i was on a lecture tour there i have gone there i put uh, a a pointer a laser pointer on the north of this mother mary and put it on tripod and fixed there and uh, recorded the whole event for 3 hours and uh, later brought out in a press conference that at least for last 3 hours mary was not moving so this was big news there at that time because the mary was all the time moving otherwise because it's it's on a or the mary statue is uh, around a 
a, a bush basically. The bush is moving on the wind. You have an optical illusion when you look from here that the maid is moving. But nobody there to do this thing. So I don't stop. If you say Jesus' crucifix has been an issue, so Mother Mary is moving also is an issue. I went one day go to do that and I mean, try to do that thing. Also, everywhere I am trying to do that thing. I went to the birthplace of John Paul II and spoke about this thing and how absurd all these kind of things. I don't, I don't stop and nobody can stop me, that I am very sure. One of the negotiation points some people are trying to bring out now, that's also very interesting. The, one of the representatives of the church contacted me, I mean through email, and said that they would like to end up the whole thing. So there should be a give and take deal. What I should do is, I should make a, I should, I'm sorry for all these things. I should make an apology statement and they would immediately withdraw the whole case. It's an easy solution. So if I want my personal security and if I want to go home and live comfortably there, yes, I should accept that. But my answer was very simple. I said, I don't apologize. There are so many people in the world, at least some people in the world, who don't apologize when they are convinced about what they are doing is correct. And even if fire or stake or crosses are made for them, they don't succumb to pressures. And I'm one amongst them. I don't do that thing. <coughs> and that's the position I have taken. And also, uh, some people, these two very same people said that, I mean, if you keep on offending these people, I said, I'm not offending. I'm speak, I'm not against anybody. I'm not against even Catholics. Because I am against the superstitions perpetrated on them. I'm against the miracle claims. I'm against the blind belief that is promoted. It's not against anybody, any, any people. I have so many Catholics who are my friends. I mean, there are priests also who are my friends. I mean, I don't hate anybody. I never believe in hating anybody on the basis of their belief system. In that case, I have been exposing more miracles of Hindus. There have been no problem. And I believe in full tolerance. I believe in religious freedom. I believe in one's own right to believe in anything. But I have full right to tell. A wrong thing is a wrong thing. A miracle is not a miracle. So if that would cost my life, I mean, that was a question I heard in one of the last meetings when I was in India. Somebody said that, uh, do you think that the Catholic Church will get you eliminated? I smiled and I answered very simply, that was in one of my television programs, one of the last television programs in India. I said, well, I don't believe that Jesus has ever resurrected. It's a mythology in my idea. But uh, if I am killed by Catholic Church, I would resurrect. As hundreds of sinners and see that this kind of suppression does not happen in the future. Thank you.